whenever you're ready. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Annabelle Espinosa. I'm a graduate student at California State University Fullerton under Dr. Ryan Walters lab. I'll be talking about my research on geographic patterns of head shape variation in California pipe fishes. So for many species, um, studies of mouth morphology have been formed us of different feeding styles, strategies, abilities, the types of prey that they eat, and their trophic position. Many of these studies have used geometric morphometrics in order to quantify these morphological differences. One of the most well-known examples is the study of faring nonati, uh, which are modifications to the pharyngeal jaw that influence the feeding capacity and efficiency. As we can see here in the picture, um, cyclids have different modifications to their pharyngeal jaw, and these modifications are associated with what food they prey on. So uh, there is different types of morphological adaptations to the feeding apparatus that are seen in several families of fishes. And these adaptations can lead to high levels of specialization, which might reduce interspecific competition and increase resource partitioning. In signatids, we can see that there is variation in their snout morphology, despite their having a really different jaw from fishes like cyclids. So fishes have been widely used to study variation in cranial morphology and its association with ecological specialization and speciation. This is because fish skulls are comprised of more than 30 bones and over 50 muscles with variations that exhibit a diversity of diets and feeding mechanisms. As we can see here, there are many bones that make up the cranium, but my study will be focusing on the change that we see in the signatus head shape. So pipe fishes are specialized suction feeders and they show an association between snout shape and prey specialization. Suction feeders particularly have shown to possess an array of functional innovations that improve their feeding efficiency. On the Pacific shoreline of California, there are two recognized species within the genus Signatus, Signatus euliscus and Signatus californiensis. The current classification of Signatus pie fishes synonymizes these four pie fishes, Eucrus, Leptorhynchus, californiensis, and Exiles, under Signatus californiensis. These pie fishes were previously classified as different species, mainly based on meristic characters. However, current mitochondrial DNA studies show that californiensis, Eucrus, Leptorhynchus, and Exiles have very low average um, sequence divergence when compared to each other. So even though there has been a shift on thinking between interspecific to intraspecific variation, there hasn't been a loss of morphological variation, but a loss of species diversity. So despite the fact that the number of pie fishes in the California coast has decreased, the variation that we see among them has not. And this is something that should not be ignored. Um, that's why the goal of my study is to perform geometric morphometric analysis of the cranial variation in Eastern Pacific pipefish to evaluate whether the hypothesized synonym species occupy the same morphospace. In the present study, the former signatus that were identified as separate species will be referred as ecomorphs of signatus californiensis. To quantify the variation in head morphology of the ecomorphs, I conducted a landmark-based geometric morphological analysis of a snout shape of 843 pie fish specimens. The specimens using this study were museum specimens of Signatus californiensis collected across its North American range. Specimens were photographed from a standard lateral right view under a dissection microscope using a 2X objective lens. I place a total of 19 landmarks that provide adequate coverage of the snout morphology with eight main landmarks and 11 semi-landmarks. So in order to analyze a species level cranial variation of Signatus californiensis, I did a principal component analysis on the 843 individuals. This principal component analysis shows that 
PC1 explains 59.3% of the variance seen, and this is characterized by the change in the snout depth from wider to thinner, and a slight change on the snout form. PC2 explains 13.5% of the total variance and shows a slight change on the snout depth. So we can notice from this PCA that both Ecomorphs californiensis and Leptorhynchus overlap with all other Ecomorphs in this study. These two Ecomorphs are also the ones with the widest range of distribution along California. Moreover, Exilis and Eucrus, which are only found in Central and Southern California, form clusters that are more discriminated. The California coastline spans about 840 miles, with fishes that inhabit these waters encountering different habitats from sandy to rocky bottoms. These marine habitats are greatly influenced by abiotic factors, including marine water current systems and temperature variation, which can shape different um, biogeographic boundaries. So these abiotic factors can influence things like salt plankton distribution and size, and pipe fishes di diet mainly consists of soil plankton. And previous studies have shown that there is an association between prey size and signatic snout length and width. Therefore, I think it is necessary to study the changes in cranial morphology while looking at the location of the pie fishes. So uh, in order to do this, I perform a canonical variate analysis that use latitudinal location of the collected samples as the priority. Uh, the samples collected were classified into four different groups, North, Central, Island, and South. So the results from the CBA show that CBA1 explains 74.6% of the variation and shows a partition in the snout depth. CBA2 explains 14.9% of the variation seen in the data and shows a, a slight change in the snout form. So um, what we can see here is the pipe fishes populations that were collected in South and Island almost completely overlap. And this is because most of the island, um, well, not most, all of the islands are actually located in Southern California. So it makes sense that this completely overlaps with the South populations. Uh, we can also see that there is some overlap between all other populations. And this is uh, because there is an intermediate shape towards um, a medium sized snout. So after that, I conducted a discriminant function analysis and this was applied as a, as a pairwise comparison to the data. The results from the DFA show that the Northern populations have a high level of percentage that self assigned to North and if we take into consideration putting together south with island, we see that they also have a, a high level of self assignment based solely on morphology. And the only one that has a lowest uh, self assignment percentage will be central populations, which tend to have an intermediate shape. So California Signatus morphospace is grouped based on population latitude location. Southern Island individuals have a wider and shorter snout with a convex shape on top. Northern locations have a thinner and elongated snout when compared to others, and individuals from central locations have a thinner snout slightly less elongated than the Northern variation, which will be an in-between shape uh, between North and South. So here we can see that there is some variation among individuals from different microgeographies. This pattern of variation that we see among Signatus californiensis follows latitudinal location. Signatus is not shape may be associated with prey use as seen in various marine species. Therefore, it is necessary to look at soil plankton differences and the various latitudes where California pie fishes are found because this is what is likely driving the patterns of variations that we see here. So as I mentioned before, the California coastline has different water current systems and water temperatures, and this can influence the soil plankton distribution and community structure. The studies done on soil plankton have shown that 
community diversity increases with higher temperature and uh, certain locations have higher zooplankton diversity because there are more species that are adapted to warmer waters. Higher diversity of zooplankton means that there are more prey sizes available and studies have shown that cygnatids with a shorter and wider snout have a more diverse diet. Moreover, zooplankton follows um, the Berman rule that states that larger organisms of related species tend to be found at higher and colder latitudes. And the studies of the dynamics of uh, cygnatids feeding show that cygnatids with a longer and thinner snout have a higher prey catch success when they prey on larger organisms. So in conclusion, uh, California pie fishes have at least two distinct groups, the north and the south. And there's an intermediate group that possesses all of the characteristics and that's why we see like an intermediate shape. And the morphological variations that we see in California pie fishes possibly follows their ecology, even though their genetics suggest that there is uh, no connectivity, there is connectivity between the ecomorphs. There may be some level of ecological specialization that is happening in these populations. Um, thank you. I would like to acknowledge all the funds that source my research, like the Coast Graduate um, Student Research Award and all these other fellowships and scholarships and my PI and committee members. Any questions? Thanks very much, Annabelle. Um, yeah, we've got a few minutes for questions. So how would you, so you, you raised the hypothesis that the snow morphology is related to the, the zooplankton that are, that are you know, available in, in the different north south gradient. How would you actually test that uh, snow morphology is an adaptation to the local local food. Yeah, so what other studies have done, they actually do like a dissection of the contents of their stomach mm -hmm. to see what uh, food items the each uh, ecomorph is eating. So this will be something that somebody else is going to be doing in the future because my lab is also looking at population structure. This is uh, somebody else is looking at that. So the next step will be to actually catch live pipe fishes and look at their, their uh, stomach contents, which is a little bit um, hard because every time we go out diving and we see probably most, the day that we see the most pipe fish is 10 pipe fish. So it's probably going to be like a really long to do it. Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, thank you. That sounds like an interesting set of experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, other uh, other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Annabel. Uh, appreciate your talk. Um, thank you. We've got a minute or two, so I mean, Sarab, you can um, start to share your slides, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll give it a minute before before we actually start. So I'm just uh, sharing my screen then. Yeah, great. So uh, is it uh, visible? It's visible. Yes, thank you, and we can hear you. Okay. Right, we'll give it, we'll give it another minute though. Okay. Uh, so I'm clear. Uh, no, let's let, let's wait uh, one more minute just so we're sort of on the same schedule as everybody else. Yeah, sure. So I just, I'm just wondering, like, am I clear? My voice is clear? Yes, your voice is clear. Yes, thank you. Okay, fine. Thank you.
All right, I think you're good to go. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, fine. Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, the exploring, uh, exploring the role of network and ecological drivers in uh, shaping the scavenging communities in the human landscape of India. So I'm Shorab, uh, Shorab Ishwesh from Dog Lab uh, uh, in Isaac, Kolkata in India. So well, let's start uh, the, okay. Okay, fine. So uh, we'll be, start, we'll be uh, talking about the scavenging communities. So the scavenging community here I am referring to is not the scavenging community that uh, the, the scavengers that feed on the carrions. So here we'll be talking about the scavengers that responded to the anthropogenic food subsidies like, uh, like the garbage dump, let's say the uh, refuge from the, uh, from the factories. Uh, it, it can be the, it can be the other, the fish discards and all. So this kind of anthropogenic food subsidies, so they are the kind of predictable. So the urban species, they usually exploit these uh, particular food sources and that actually uh, giving our eyes like, uh, so that's telling us that their behavioral plasticity and the variable niche adaptability in that particular landscape. Well, so the terrestrial scavengers, they are vital for our ecosystem because they are key, key species in ecosystem functioning. Uh, they help in decomposing uh, the uh, the organic components. They are uh, helping in nutrient cycling and also maintain the food stability. And also, they uh, they also uh, they reduce the pest population and the diseases or maybe the genetic diseases that we usually uh, we, uh, we we usually encounter. So here in the scenario in Global South in LMNIC, where the in low income countries like in Global South, the the, the the garbage management are not that sufficient and not or not in a sophisticated way. So what what happens? So these these particular anthropogenic food subsidies are attract lot of a lot of species, including the wild species wild animals as well. So that lead to their dietary shift and uh, uh, so and 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 that is something is telling us that how this particular species is getting adapted or using this particular uh, food sources for, for their uh, sustenance. So that's why we are trying to uh, understand that how this particular species of the communities that is associated with this urban uh, or the anthropogenic food waste are actually functioning in human dominated landscape. So for that, we are trying to understand the diversity of scavenging yield that is associated with this daily human generated waste, like the kitchen waste or the, or the human generated waste. And also to study the patterns of different species where and of where the food is provided, how they respond to these particular food sources. And here, so here in the global south, uh, the free ranging dogs are one of the most. Uh, they are the scavengers. So spe specifically, we try to understand their role in the scavenging guild and how they impact the diversity of scavengers that exploit this ad hoc food resource that we have produced. Well. So later on, the finally, we try to understand the interactions patterns of the scavengers in response to the human generated food sources and identify the key species uh, that is responsible for the, uh, that are can be termed as the keystone, keystone species for this particular network. Well, so our study site is in India, particularly uh, we have done this experiment in 15 different sites in West Bengal. And over these two years, like 2020 and 2021, we have collected around uh, data around 498 uh, of different sessions. Well, so let's talk about how we have done it. Well, so what we have done, so we, we use the food item like rice or roti that is soaked with the veg and non-veg curry and done the experiments in two different sessions, the morning at noon. So what I have done, so we have placed the food that is, we have, as earlier mentioned, rice and non-veg or, ve or veg curry and placed it in a random place away from the existing resources. Then we have started the video recording until the food is finished by the scavenger species or system unit, which is the earliest. And then we have done the same thing in a same location for uh, 10 days, for 10 consecutive days, twice, uh, uh, tw twice a day, like in the morning and the noon. 
Well, so like now we'll talk about the results. So these species, these many species, the so 17 different vertebrate species has responded to the food or in, in our study sites. So out of them, 12 are the bird species and five are the vertebrates. And some of them are reported for the first time and responded to the anthropogenic food, uh, food resources. Well, so fine, after that, we try to understand the diversity pattern. So here we will learn about how the first species that has appeared in the, uh, in, in the experiment that we named as the first scavenger species on the station diversity. So station diversity means in a particular session, how many species have responded to it. So we, we have calculated the diversity uh, like on the abundance or response of the uh, animals that in, in a particular session. So here we try to understand the, the fast, the impact of the fast species on the session diversity. So here what I, we have seen the way in dogs was where the fast uh, responder or the fast scavenger species. So then the session diversity was significantly decreased. Well, so that we got to understand that the dogs has a significant effect on the session diversity. Then we try to understand the order the dog has responded in a particular session has any effect on or not. So here we try to understand the different orders, like from the first order, second order, third order, and uh, and rest of the order. And inner means that is the no no response. That is dogs are absent in the particular uh, session. So what we have seen that session diversity was significantly increased when dogs were or not present or dog were uh, were came in the later. That means when the dogs were the first, were the first, the session diversity was significantly. I mean, uh, I mean, impacted. Well, so that was on the diversity. Now we try to understand the latency of the first scavenger species. The which species are the uh, which, which, which species responded uh, in in uh, in like uh, how? So well, here you also seen that the dog responds to the fastest among the other species, uh, other other scavenger species that has first encountered the particular food sources. Well, so dogs were the fastest among the responder. Fine. So now, right then later on, we try to understand the networks. So here, this particular graph, we uh, is a is a bipartite network where we trying to understand the relationship between scavengers and the and and, and then the places where they have uh, responded. Well, we have the, done the study like the like the study site. So the rectangles represent the number of species have responded in a particular site. Both in the left side, these are the different 15 different sites. And the right side, these are the scavenger species that has responded. And the, then the width of this rectangle, a rectangle represent the number of number of time these species have responded. And the introductions pattern, these are nodes represent the number of times they are present in each site. So here, so, so uh, here we have calculated the nestedness value and the specialized index. So NODF or the nestedness value that uh, that is range between one to 10, one to, one to 100. Uh, 100 being the fully nested, that means the, the network is fully integrated and has most of the stability. And the specialization index is, is uh, like uh, the, its range is between from zero to one. One being highly specialized, like being the, so, so that the network is more vulnerable because most of the, most of the species are specialized. And zero means is highly, uh, I mean, highly, uh, I mean, uh, generalized. I mean, the, the stability of the network is more. So in our case, uh, the scavenging, uh, network that we have constructed is moderately nested and moderately specialized. Fine. So that we understood or we got to know about the introductions pattern. Now it was the time to identify the species uh, with the impact of the species in that particular network, like the importance of the species for the stability of that particular network. So what we have done, so for that particular uh, thing we have uh, we have done the virtual exclusion. So what we have done, so from a network, we have picked a certain species out and then we have checked the uh, network specializations and as well as the nestedness of the, of the network. 
So in both the case, what we have seen, so when we we, we extracted out uh, or we have eliminated dogs and common minors uh, from the network, we have seen in the left that the network specialization index has increased so that it is indicating that dogs and common minor were the most generally species and leading to the stability of that particular network that we have constructed, that is the scavenging network. In case of network nestedness, that we, we have seen the same pattern. Well, we have we, we have actually excluded dogs and common mina. The, uh, the, the value of network nestedness and uh, NODF has increased more than 30% and 20%. So it's impacting that the, these two particular species, this dog and common mina, were the most important for the network integrity and stability of the network, giving them the one of the most general species in the scavenging network in human dominated landscape in India. Fine. So then, uh, so that we got to know that dogs and common men are the most general species and giving the most impactful, uh, I mean, uh, or more in impactful species in the network. Then we try to understand now is the time to find the keystone species. So here we are representing this normality degree between the centrality and closeness centrality. This particular thing tells us the keystone species in a particular network. So we have here you also seen that most of the uh, most of so the dogs so the dogs and the common mana is contributing to the highest amount in nominative degree and here in case of between the centrality so in the in our network in all the in the scavenging network what we have seen so far is that seventy percent of the species are acting as the connective species because they are the value is is is, is greater than zero. And in, and in those particular connective species, dogs and common mina are sharing 50% and 11% and cumulatively 61% of the total contribution in the, in, as, as a connective species, giving them uh, the most impactful species in the network. And in case of this central closely closeness centrality, the, we found that dogs found to be the highest among the, all the scavenger species in the network, giving them the rise that we can we can tell that the this but two particular species that uh, dog and common mina being the most impactful keystone species in the scavenging network. Well, so in conclusion, but we can we can uh, think about the our, we can our study will give us insights into the dietary shifts and the urban adaptation of some species because several new species we have uh, we have found like jungle manna, pied manna, spotted dove, and northern palm squirrel or the, or the nugator cockle. So all of these bird species were reported for the first time responding on exploiting the human generated food. And is giving they giving us a uh, as an understanding that how these wild species are getting adapted to the urban environment and they are usually uh, I mean uh, exploiting the resources being the scavenger species or they are also giving rise about uh, the insights about our urban adaptations and how the species is getting adapted in the human dominated landscape. And yes, uh, then we can think about this. Yes, free ranging dogs, they have a significant impact on the scavenger diversity, or they all are the fastest, or they were quicker among the, all the scavenger species present in the human dominated landscape and giving us, a, we can say, the, the, and they're becoming one of the most efficient scavengers in, uh, the, in the Anthropocene. Well, uh, next, what we uh, like, like to understand that yes, uh, in the particular network, what we have constructed, dog and common mina are the most vital species for maintaining the overall network integrity and giving the stability of the particular network that we have constructed as uh, as whole the scavenging network. They are the most impactful impactful pair in the in in that particular uh, context and exploiting the urban uh, generated food resources and making an uh, impactful uh, role in ecosystem functioning in human dominated landscape. Well, uh, so these are the references I have used for, for the presentation and fine. So these are the key people I want to acknowledge. I want to acknowledge returning the to my mentor and uh, my PI for, for the support and encouragement and uh, in this throughout this year. 
Dr. Rubina Mundal for his instant uh, so any instant help or uh, like being a go-to person always, and the other uh, co-authors in the in, in in the particular paper, Tathagato and all, and yeah, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Sarab. Um, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the the next speaker. But if you do have um, uh, questions, you can send Sarab a, a direct message. Um, so thanks again. Um, all right, um, um, Meta, did you want to share your slides? Yeah. We're well, a bit quiet. Um, if you if you're able to get closer to the microphone, that would probably be helpful. Is it better now? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. The slides visible? Yes, here it looks good. Thank you. I'll start then. Um, hello. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the work that I've carried out in population dynamics, um, namely looking at if life cycle length affects stability. So what is stability? If we consider these two populations here, is there a way in which we can determine which of these populations is more stable? Now, one of the ways to do this is to look at persistence and say that the population that takes a longer time to go extinct would be more stable. Another way is to examine the change in population size over time. And um, the aspect that would be of importance here is the amplitude of these size fluctuations. We find that often population sizes tend to suddenly increase and then decrease. And this range of behavior over time could give us some clues about the stability of populations. So if we take a look at this graph, um, we see that both of these populations shown in different colors are fluctuating to the same extent. And therefore, if we looked at only the fluctuations, we may not find a difference in stability between the two. However, the purple population fluctuates much closer to zero and therefore has a greater chance of going extinct. And so it is quite useful to consider multiple measures when looking at assessing stability of populations. So our lab works on Drosophila melanogaster and we use experimental evolution to answer um, a lot of questions. So we have a set of populations called the FEJs, which have been selected for rapid development and early reproduction from their ancestors, which are called the JBs. As a result of the selection pressure, they are also maintained on very different cycle lengths. The JBs are maintained on a 21-day cycle, while the FEJs are maintained on a 10-day cycle length. Now, um, one of the questions that was asked in our lab was if population dynamics and stability was affected as a consequence of this life history evolution. And it was found that in terms of extinction probability, the FEJs and JBs were not significantly different from one another. However, if we compared the extent of fluctuations that happened in the populations over time, the FEJs actually had far lower fluctuations than JBs, which meant that it, they had actually evolved to become more stable than the JBs. However, this particular experiment was carried out on a 21-day cycle. Now, the key point here is that a 21-day-old population of FEJs would not behave the same way as a 10-day-old population of FEJs, primarily because there are large changes in terms of the number of individuals which would end up surviving, as well as the fecundity of the females that would end up surviving till day 21. And it is possible that these changes in survivorship and fecundity is what majorly contributed to the results that were seen in the earlier experiment. And if the FEJs were to be assayed on a shorter cycle length, the results would change. So to assess this, I carried out the experiment to look at cycle length and its impact on dynamics. Um, and I used two more sets of populations which were available in the lab. They have basically been relaxed from the FEJs. They are RRFs, which have been relaxed for rapid development, selection pressure, and the RFs, which have been relaxed for both rapid development and early reproduction. Now, as a consequence of this, all four sets of populations are basically maintained on four different cycle lengths. And so I 
assess them across two types of cycle lengths. One was a 12 day cycle length, which you know would be um, more close to the native regime of RF, RRFs and FEJs, and an 18 day cycle length, which would be close to the native regimes of RFs and JVs. I then subjected these populations to destabilizing food regimes in order to induce fluctuations in population sizes and potential extinctions to then understand its impact on the subsequent dynamics. So the setup for the experiment was as follows. The arrows on the top indicate basically the cycle length and what would occur at which period of time. Each of these uh, populations were initiated in single vials using four males and four females with 1.5 ml of the uh, food medium. After 24 hours, these adults were removed and the eggs were allowed to develop. And finally, when the adults are closed, they were collected into adult collection vials, which had approximately four ml of the food. Fresh food was provided on alternate days to these flies. And ultimately, the adults were subjected to two types of um, regimes, either the LL or the LH, both of which are destabilizing. In both of them, the larvae basically get 1.5 ml of food, which I mentioned earlier. But the adults um, in the LH regime, in addition to the food, also receive a yeast supplement paste. This is known to boost fecundity and basically increase the destability of the LH regime relative to the LL regime. They receive this conditioning for a period of two days, after which all the flies in the vial were allowed to lay eggs to initiate the next generation. And the number of flies were basically counted once the next generation was initiated. And this census basically gave rise to a time series of population size over time. So what can we use this to measure? One is the fluctuation index, which measures the extent of fluctuation in population size. So to put it simply, the lower the fluctuation index, the greater is the constancy stability of the population. The second is extinction probability, which measures the probability of extinction over time. So again, the lower the extinction rate, the greater is the persistence of the population. Apart from this, I could also estimate various population level parameters, which also affect dynamics and stability. They are the intrinsic growth rate, which has been shown to affect dynamics and which range from um, simple point equilibrium all the way to seemingly chaotic dynamics, as well as the equilibrium population size K, which uh, has been shown that when you have a lower K value, you are more susceptible to extinctions. And this is done by fitting the Ricker equation to the population time series data. So if we now move on to the results for constancy stability, um, I would just like to remind everyone that the 18 day cycle LH regime, which is this, would be the closest to the results that were um, of the experiment that were uh, that was carried out earlier. So we can see that here, similar to what was observed in the earlier experiment, the FEJs have a much lower fluctuation index compared to the JVs, which means they are more stable in terms of constancy. However, in the 12 day cycle, in the same food regime, we find that that significant significance has disappeared, which meant that cycle length indeed played a role in determining the dynamics that were observed in the earlier study. If we now look at persistence stability, we find that um, FEJs and JBs are not significantly different from each other, be it in a 12-day or an 18-day cycle for the LH regime. However, in the 12-day cycle, the JBs have higher extinction rates, whereas that trend gets flipped in an 18-day cycle. If we now look at the estimates of the population um, level parameters, we see that when it comes to the 18-day cycle in the LH regime, FEJs have a significantly lower growth rate compared to JBs. This again could be one of the reasons why the fluctuations are lower and therefore they appear to be more stable. But if we shift to a 12-day cycle for the same food regime, we see that the significance has disappeared. If we now look at the equilibrium population size, we again see that if we move from the LH regime in 12-day cycle to the 18-day cycle, the FEJs suddenly have a much lower equilibrium population size, and this significance is lost across any of the other segments. Additionally, if we look at the theory of density-dependent selection, 
um, and we consider this population, which has a certain value of R and K, and compare it to this population, which has a lower value of R, but a higher value of K, theory suggests that population one would fare better at lower densities because of its higher growth rate and therefore would eventually outcompete population two. But at higher densities, population two would fare better because of its ability to maintain a greater population size and would outcompete population one immediately. So considering this, we can now see that RFs and RRFs, interestingly, have a consistently higher value of K relative to JBs and FEJs across all cycle lengths and food regimes. This could be indicative of the evolution of greater larval competitive ability in these populations, which would form an interesting thing to study in future because it would be another correlated response to selection, um, which would be quite interesting to look at. So to summarize, cycle length does indeed affect dynamics both in terms of constancy and persistence. And therefore, it is important to take this into consideration, especially when one is comparing populations which have different cycle lengths. Additionally, I found evidence of evolution of greater larval competitive ability in the relaxed selection populations. And um, this proves to be an interesting line of research to take forward. So thank you. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Meta. We have uh, time for a question or two. Yeah. Was, was I can name. ask a question while I wait to see if anybody, I can ask a question while I wait to see if anybody else wants to ask one. Uh, first off, great talk. Um, so I studied circadian biology and I came across this paper that basically suggested that um, the timing in which your soft lay eggs is dependent on if a female is isolated or in a social group. So my question is, um, are there any social dynamic effects during early development to consider, such as competition, um, and how would that play into the interpretation of your result? Uh, right. So if we can just go back to this slide. Um, there is competition here in this stage, in the early stages when we initiate the population, because we give them only 1.5 ml of food. So it does create larval competition. And subsequently, even if, um, say, they lay a large number of eggs and they manage to survive, there is um, a decent amount of adult competition that could also exist for resources, space, mates, and all of that. Um, and what usually, what has been shown is that the larval competition plays a greater role in determining the dynamics um, because the amount of food available directly relates to um, the size of the adults also that come out and thereby the fecundity of the females as well because body sizes really fecundity in drosophila and so the larval competition axis has a greater role to play in determining the dynamics of the populations Well, thank you. And, and I mean, a bit of a follow-up, I guess. I mean, you pointed out that in your relaxed selection, you you seem to evolve greater larval competitive ability. Were you expecting that? And you know, wh why? That seems like a, a counterintuitive result, maybe. Right. So um, it was actually shown that um, so the tests were. So when the earlier assay was done comparing JBs and FEJs, um, they had also done a separate assay which looked at the larval competitive ability because the idea was that if you develop faster um, to adulthood, um, you are most likely going to be better competitors as larvae. So when you select for faster development, one would expect that there would be greater larval competitive ability as a correlated response. However, in these set of populations, it was found that the FEJs had actually not got greater larval ability. And um, one of the major reasons was that the selection pressure for faster development is so strong that it leaves not much room for other things to evolve other than just the direct response. Uh, but then that's what makes this part interesting, because once RFs and RRFs have been relaxed from the FEJs, they are now no longer under that stringent selection pressure. But at the same time, they do develop somewhat early because of the cycle lengths being shorter. 
and we see that there is evidence of greater larval competitive ability. So it looks like some sort of residual selection for faster development seems to be driving this. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, and we'll move on to the next speaker now. Um, Inan, yeah. do you want to share your slides? Yes, just a second. Can you see it well? Yes, that's great. Okay. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm Inon Scharf. I work at Tel Aviv University. I uh, did this work together with Graham Ruxton from St. Andrews University, and I'm going to talk today about shadow competition. Uh, what you can see in the photo are pitfall traps uh, built by warm lion larvae, small insects. Uh, the one in the periphery get more prey than those in the center, and this is what shadow competition is about. But let's start with saying a few words on competition in general. So competition is ever present in nature. It's a negative interaction. Both competitors lose something. Um, it is a key procedure uh, in, in evolution and ecology. Uh, most literature focuses, focuses on the two most important types of competition, interference and exploitation. Interference is a direct interaction. It involves aggression or when one competitor blocks the way of the prey or the food to arrive to the other competitor. Uh, exploitation, in contrast, is an indirect inter interaction, uh, and it means reducing the joint pool of resources by both uh, competitors. Shadow competition is when a competitor earlier in the trajectory uh, of uh, moving food or prey intercepts the food before it reaches another individual further downstream. Um, and here you can see this ant moving from the right to the left. Uh, these are pitfall traps uh, built by, let's say, warm lions on ant lions. It will encounter the, the first one, will be consumed by it, and the second one downstream gets nothing. Um, so clearly, positions upstream are better in this sense. Um, there is a catch here, or some simplifying assumption. Um, according to shadow competition, the, the prey must start moving outside of the cluster, because if it's landing in the middle or jumping into the center, there is no shadow competition. Um, so shadow competition is neither interference nor exploitation. Um, it is not interference because there is no direct interaction between competitors, they don't touch each other. It is not exploitation because there is no reduction of the joint pool of resources. So what is special about shadow competition? The key is, is to understand its spatial component. I, I'm always confused with special and spatial in English. Um, so so in, in shadow competition, there is a strong referral to the spatial component, the positions of the competitors uh, against each other and the movement directions of the prey. And all those uh, components are not very relevant in the two main competition types of interference and exploitation. Um, so I have three goals here in my talk. The first, I hope I did it well, is to define shadow competition and explain its uh, uniqueness. The second time, which I will do immediately, is to try and convince you that it is much more common than, than one would expect. And the third is to present some scenarios that can either enhance or impair shadow competition, and I examine them using a simulation model. Um, this talk is based on two papers. The first was, was published this year in OICOS. It's a forum paper. Uh, and the second one is the combination of simulation models, which is got also in OICOS in, in review now. So a brief history of shadow competition. Um, it has been first described by Wilson in 74 in uh, his Biotropica paper. Uh, Wilson worked on ant lamps. Uh, pit, build, pit building ant lions. And this suggested that uh, ant lions should arrange themselves in something called the donut configuration. This is how a donut configuration should look like uh, in A. Uh, it means that all ant lions would like to be located on the periphery of the cluster while the center is empty. And we already know that the central positions receive less prey, so, so it's not a good position. Uh, to, to be located there. Uh, B is one example of an observed pattern. You can see that, that the center is quite empty also here. Um, the problem with Wilson, or not problem, Wilson did not define it exactly as, as shadow competition. He used the word shadow, 
but not shadow competition. This uh, exact term was coined by Linton a few years later in his evolutionary ecology paper, and he also worked on end lamps. Um, so shadow competition uh, refers, uh, well, let's say there are, in the literature, there are about 20, 25, 30 at, maxim, at, a, at the maximum papers on shadow competition, calling it by its name. And all these systems are systems of sit and wait predators and moving prey, like that example uh, you can see in this scheme. But we, we, there is no reason what, not to assume why it cannot work also in uh, a system of moving predators and sedentary prey, especially if the moving predators are forced to move one behind the other. And it can also work when both are moving or even when one is sedentary and the other is not moving, but is moved by some external force, let's say a flow of water or airflow and so on. Um, th this is just one example in which uh, there is shadow competition, but it is not called by its name. This is a study on gull forming uh, aphids. The, the main idea of the study was to discuss ideal free distribution in aphids. Uh, but um, it also inexplicitly described shadow competition. So what you can see in this scheme is the leaf. Uh, the base of the leaf down uh, receives more, more food because the food is arriving from there. Um, and and the, the, the aphid closest to the base of the leaf has more progeny than the next one afterwards. And this is a clear case of shadow competition, although it was not called that way. There are many examples also out of biology. Um, and, and one of my favorite is something called radar shadow. So when two combat planes uh, fly one next to the other, um, uh, they can get very close to each other. And then let's imagine that the radar that wants to detect them is the predator and the combat planes are the prey. So there is something called radar shadow. And it means when the two planes are too close to each other, the, the radar can detect only the closest of the two and the second one can hide in its shadow. And this is just an analogy or to show you that shadow competition is also useful out of biology. I have another example in the last slide. Um, so there are three main consequences of shadow competition or let's see three phenomena that if we observe them in the system, we can guess the shadow competition is present. One is that peripheral positions receive more prey than central ones. The second one is that as a consequence of the first one, there are more frequent relocation of individuals from the cluster cent center than uh, peripheral positions. And the third one is the shadow competition increases the variability in prey capture success, which further increases with prey abundance. And is, it is also often increased with predator abundance. So now I move to the simulations we did. Uh, the first scenario dealt with the ricochet effect, and maybe it's, it's a good idea to say a few words on what it is. So the ricochet effect was demonstrated in web building spiders. It refers to the prey, let's say a fly, bouncing from several predators in succession until being caught by the last one. Um, the ricochet effect clearly can moderate shadow competition. There is a nice uh, study by, by Rao from 2009. And this is clear, it is clear why, because it enables the prey to penetrate further inside the cluster and it is not completely blocked in the periphery. Um, however, the ricochet effect as defined in the literature until now is neutral towards whether capture chances increase, decrease, or do not change with successive predator encounters. And these are just two examples. Um, this is the prey, the butterfly, and the two webs are the predators. So one case is an increasing ricochet effect. It means that uh, the prey has a, a decreasing uh, chances to get captured by the predator with successive capture attempts. And B is a decreasing ricochet effect in which uh, the prey has an increasing chance to be captured in successive capture attempts. Um, both can make sense. I guess it's system specific. An increasing capture success makes sense if the prey gets, uh, for example, tired or injured. And also a decreasing capture success can happen if the, the prey become more vigilant after the first attempt. Um, and there are different consequences for shadow competition, as I will immediately show you. So I, I, we designed a grid-based individual-based model in MATLAB, uh, the predators were ambush ones or sit and wait ones. The prey was moving. The prey started the arena's edges. We had 100 runs each time until all prey are captured. Um, then I calculated some index of shadow competition based on the distance from arena edges. 
And lower values in this index mean that stronger uh, that sh shadow competition is stronger. So when there is an increase in ricochet effect, it means that with successive uh, capture attempts, the, the chance of capture decreases. Then we can see that shadow competition gets higher, gets most gets stronger compared to a null expectation. And the opposite case of a decrease in ricochet effect when it is uh, easier to capture the prey uh, later on, then we get um, um, a decrease in uh, um, uh, a weaker shadow uh, competition. Uh, so it is important for, for each system to, to define what the, the, um, the ricochet effect is we are talking about. And this is not never done, I think. The second scenario deals with the direction the predators are facing. So most predators have a binocular vision and the blind area behind, behind them. These are three hawks. Uh, the blind area behind them is in, in black. The, the binocular vision uh, is in gray. And we can assume that, that when they are facing forward, they capture better. They have a higher chance to capture the prey. Um, so, so I, I, the, the scenario here is that predators must face the prey uh, direction in order to capture it. So if we assume that here the gray area, the gray arrow uh, is the prey and the black big arrow is the predator, are the two predator. Uh, so um, in the upper level, the first one captures the prey. In the second level, uh, the second one captures the prey. And in the third example, no one is capturing the prey because no one is looking at it. So what happens if we simulate this scenario? Um, uh, what happens is that shadow competition gets stronger. Um, if we limit the field of view of the predator, and the reason I think is, is intuitive, this is because predators in the periphery know where to look. They just look out. They look to the periphery, to the edge, and most prey is come. Most prey are coming from there. But if you're in the center, you don't know where to look at because prey come randomly from all four positions. Um, the third scenario uh, I see we simulated uh, dealt with the phenomenon of prey moving along a barrier. Um, many animals tend to do so. They are uh, like uh, these animals, and not only, it it's really goes through and, and among taxa well. This is an example of, of an ant species. You can see how well they, they follow an arena wall. An arena, an arena wall. Um, it can be either a defensive behavior or exploratory one, but for this sake, it doesn't matter so much. Um, and it is clear to understand why positions along the barrier or on the wall should be more profitable for predators. Uh, but this is not true for all positions along the barrier or the wall. So barrier peripheral positions like this one, uh, you can see the one below, is better than barrier central positions. And this is due to shadow competition. And here I increase the number of predators along the wall. And in the y-axis, you can see the prey items captured. So first of all, the, the barrier periphery or peripheral positions do always the best and by far. But the identity of the second best strategy is changing. If we have only a few predators along the barrier or the wall, uh, barrier center posi central positions do better. And if we have more, uh, the pattern switches and random positions uh, not along the wall do better. And this is, I think, important because the, the predators need to follow or to, to understand somehow uh, where they are, if they are in a very peripheral position or a very center position. And this can be an argument why not actually to be located along the wall. Um, the last scenario we simulated is a three-level system of ambush predators, uh, moving herbivores, searching for plants and plants in patches. This is, uh, this is an ex just an example. Uh, the herbivore is to the left. It wishes to eat the plants. And there are some predators ambushing inside. One is upstream, one is downstream. The herbivores typically use, in these cases, something called area-restricted search, which is a di directional movement between patches followed by a non-directional movement within the patches. Um, and here too, peripheral positions are superior to cluster central ones, especially because the switch in movement to non-directional one. Uh, but also here, there is an increase in this difference between the periphery and central positions with predator density. So as predator density increases, we can see that it is better to be in the periphery due to shadow competition. So in short, uh, three take-home messages. So shadow competition is more common than one thinks. It is inherently different from both interference and exploitation. 
and it is differently affected by the ricochet effect, field, view of, field of view of the predators, prey movement along the wall, and herbivores searching for plants in the clusters, and I guess many, and also many others, but this is what we simulated so far. So thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm really happy to answer questions. Thanks very much, Inan. Um, uh, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, you do have a couple of questions in the chat, so maybe- I'll can... answer. Yeah. Follow those up by, by direct message. Um, uh, okay, great. Thank you. And we will move to our last speaker now, uh, Gerard. Uh, you can share your slides when you're ready. Okay. Share screen. Second, <laughs> sorry. Okay, let's see. So there we go. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Yep, that's good. Good. Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Gerard Allen, and today I'm going to be sharing a study that we did that looks at the relative roles of genomic variation in, and environmental variation in a foundation tree species. Um, and what you see in this photo is um, a riparian corridor. Uh, that consists of Fremont cottonwood, which is considered to be a foundation tree species in the American Southwest. And then I'd also like to acknowledge my co-authors on this study, which are shown below. So um, we have uh, conducted a lot of studies uh, that have shown that genetic variation is a very important with respect to a number of phenotypic community and ecosystem traits uh, in this species. Uh, where genetic variation accounts for a large fraction of things like plant growth, uh, trophic structure associated with uh, tree insects and birds, uh, the stability of communities on these trees, um, and um, even ecosystem processes like nu nutrient cycling. Uh, and then also a large fraction of biodiversity expl is explained by genetic variation in these trees. And so this particular tree is called Fremont Cottonwood. And um, today I'm gonna to be talking about how uh, the relative roles of genetic variation and environmental variation influence two dependent communities on these trees. So uh, this is study is part of a macrosystems uh, biology study uh, that looks specifically at widespread uh, uh, species on the landscape. Um, and the interactions that these species have with different uh, species, including entire communities across broad spatial and temporal scales. And we're interested in understanding the contributions of genetic and environmental variation specifically on community composition with the idea that we would gain insight into microevolutionary processes that influence community specific patterns at different geographic scales, local to regional. So to accomplish these objectives, um, we um, generated a genomic data set uh, for 453 trees across 58 sites. Uh, we used RADSeq sequencing to do this. Um, and the environmental uh, variables that we chose, uh, about 20 of them as predictor variables included ones associated with temperature, precipitation, wind, and hydrological indices. And then we examine both of these data sets in the context of geography uh, at different scales, from local stands to ecoregional scale, all the way up to the macrosystem or continental scale. The two communities that we investigated include leaf modifying arthropods. These include things like leaf miners on the trees, and leaf gallers as well. And then we also uh, surveyed these trees for twig fungal endophytes. 
and we characterize the communities of fungal endophytes using ITS amplicon sequencing, and then Gray Curtis dissimilarity matrices were developed from that. And then we analyze the data uh, using simple and partial mantel tests. So um, to examine the effects of tree genetic and environmental distance on community similarity at different scales, we came up with three main predictions uh, for these data. And beginning with geography, um, we uh, look at the geographic scale uh, at the level of local stands with respect to the influence of genetic and environmental variation on community similarity scaling all the way up to ecoregions and then macro system scale. And um, what we predict is that environmental variation would shape genomic variation at large spatial scales. And then we also looked at uh, the effect of tree genetic uh, variation and how it impacts community organization from the scale of individuals all the way up to ecotypes where we expect that the influence of genetic variation would be quite strong at the level of individual genotypes, and then decreasing as we move across the landscape from individuals to populations all the way up to ecotypes. Um, and then we also looked at a phenomenon referred to as non-stationarity as our third prediction for these data. Um, and this is associated with post-tree community phenotype associations where non-stationarity um, basically is the idea that a particular variable, um, it will be variable at different scales across the landscape. And then together, all of this um, is related to the cross-scale emergence of higher level properties with respect to community organization that are in part a function of genetic and environmental variation. So let's move on uh, to the predictions. Uh, and then, but just a little bit about non-stationarity uh, and its relevance to macrosystems biology. Um, the idea here is that macrosystems research relies on identifying the scale at which different evolutionary processes influence observable patterns. Uh, so like the effect of genetic variation in gene flow on community composition and structure. And then we can make predictions across scales uh, or at large scales, but this can be challenging because of heterogeneity in different factors that influence things like community diversity and structure. And so non-stationarity examines whether a particular factor associated with a process at a particular scale produces a consistent pattern at a larger scale. And so here we're going to be looking at uh, two factors, genomic and environmental variation at the level of individuals, populations, and then all the way up to ecotypes. So um, I've mentioned uh, the ecotypes now, and so here's what we know with respect to Fremont Cottonwood. Um, based on the RADSeq sequencing that we did, uh, and we find that the species is clustered into three large genetic groups. These groups are defined as the Utah High Plateau that you see at the top of the graph on the left, the Sonoran Desert in light blue, and then the Central California Valley on the left. And so these uh, are climatically defined regions that are strongly as associated with the partitioning of genetic variation in this species where climate explains up to 49% of the variation of these different ecotypes. So we see this strong association between partitioning of genetic variation and the influence of climate, suggesting that these trees are locally adapted with respect to their occurrence on the landscape into three major groups. All right, so, um, oh, so just quickly, so that supports our, our first hypothesis that environmental variation um, uh, has a lot to do with structuring the species in at large spatial scales into the three ecotypes. Okay, moving on to our second uh, uh, prediction then that tree, uh, tree genetic variation influences community similarity. Here we're just looking at the influence of geography, environmental distance, uh, and genetic distance on um, community arthropod community similarity. And what we see here 
is that at the individual base level of trees, we see a significant contribution with respect to environmental variation, uh, accounting for um, about 17, uh, or 18 and 19 percent of the variation that we see in arthropod community similarity uh, on the landscape. But then when we look at this at the population level, we see that there is an increased effect of the influence of environmental variation on arthropod community similarity, accounting for up to 24% um, of the variation in communities uh, when we partial out things like geography uh, and genetic distance, even, even greater amount. So then moving on, uh, we also see that there is still a contribution uh, from the genetic uh, perspective, accounting for up to, I can't quite see that, 13% of the uh, variation in arthropod community similarity, uh, according to these results. So this suggests that the environment plays a strong role in shaping uh, communities uh, on the landscape uh, at the individual and then even more at the population base level, but we still see a contribution based on genetic variation. Okay, now looking at um, the relative contributions of genetic variation and uh, environmental variation on the endophyte community, we see approximately equal contributions from both uh, environment and geography here. Um, and then when we move to the population base level, the environment plays no significant role, but we do see a significant role for um, the effect of genetic variation on community similarity, followed by a somewhat decreased role for geographic variation. Um, but this is interesting because we know that endophytes are more closely associated with the tree species because they're embedded in the tissue the actual leaf and twig tissue of these trees. So uh, seeing a larger uh, fraction of genetic variation accounting for endophyte community similarity is not surprising. Oops, okay. Now, um, we also asked the question, uh, to what extent does genomic variation uh, influence both uh, arthropod and endophyte community organization at an even larger scale at the level of ecotypes. And I showed you earlier that these ecotypes are significantly genetically differentiated and climatically uh, differentiated with respect to different climate niches on the landscape. And we see here that both arthropod communities and endophyte communities are also significantly structured at large spatial scales at the level of ecotypes. And then continuing here um, at, the, at the higher level, which would be including all three ecotypes at the macrosystem scale, we see that for arthropods, um, environmental variation explains a fairly large fraction of their similarity at the macrosystem scale. But interestingly enough, we also see that while a lot of arthropods are generalist, um, we see that some of them are also indicator species with respect to the uh, ecotypes um, that they are associated with, uh, the, the Sonoran Desert, the Central California Valley, and the Utah High Plateau. And so this is interesting from the perspective of particular arthropods being indicator species at the ecotype level as well. Okay, and then moving on to our hypothesis of non-stationarity, we did see uh, non-stationarity for both communities. Uh, for the arthropods, we see an amplification of the influence of environmental variation when we move from an individual-based model to a population-based model. And then we also see that for the endophyte community with no significant contribution uh, from genetics at the individual-based model, but uh, a contribution that is significant at the population-based model. Okay, so um, what does all this say? It suggests that foundation species uh, can be drivers of community diversity and structure, uh, and that both genomic and environmental variation play a role in shaping these communities. Um, we saw that environmental variation is important, but tree genetic variation can also play a role for both of the communities, 
but this effect is both scale and community dependent. Um, we also saw that environmental variation plays a strong role for arthropods and tree genetics is more important for endophytes. Um, in terms of non-stationarity, we saw an amplification of the effect of the influence of um, environmental variation with respect to arthropod communities going from an individual to a population-based model. And then in the case of endophyte communities, we see that genetic variation explains more variation in this community uh, at a population level. So together, these data suggest that both host tree genetics and the environment are critical for shaping the diversity and structure of these communities and their emergent properties um, across the range of this foundation tree species. Thanks very much.